A more perfect you, the pursuit of perfection in Christ. This is lesson number four in the series, Paul's teaching on perfection, Galatians 5. If you have your Bibles, you want to open them there. So we pick up our series uh, on a more perfect you, and in this lesson we're going to start focusing on the passage in the book of Galatians that inspired the title of the book and the lessons that we're doing. So I've spent uh, three uh, sessions setting up the series by explaining the ideas of conditional and actual perfection and how these relate to each other and how they relate to the series um, itself. So very briefly, we have said that conditional perfection is that state of being righteous or justified before God that we receive through faith in Christ when we express that faith in repentance and baptism. Um, we are considered perfect, considered as perfect as Christ is. Boy, think about that for a second. No second class perfection, as perfect as Christ is. And at judgment, it is this conditional perfection that God will see in order to let us share heavenly eternity with Him. Conditional perfection. Actual perfection is the ideal of Christ that we pursue in everyday life through the help of the Holy Spirit. We do this not to accomplish conditional perfection. We already have that. That's a free gift given to us by God. We pursue actual perfection as a way of glorifying God and providing a witness to others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do you make an attempt to love your enemies? Because loving your enemies is not fun and it's difficult and it's not rewarding in certain ways. I make an effort to love my enemies because it is a witness of my faith. People who see that will say, he must be a Christian because only Christians make an effort to love their enemies. What others see in me is the degree of actual perfection created in me through the work of the Spirit. This is what Paul will describe in Galatians 5 and what we will begin to study today. Now what God sees is the conditional perfection which is complete and satisfying to Him. Men see the actual perfection. God sees the conditional perfection. So when we describe Christ, we are really describing what God sees in us when He looks at us in judgment. Conditional perfection, therefore, uses words like righteous or glorious or powerful or transcendent or eternal or heavenly or victorious or spiritual or godly, all these words. They're talking about conditional perfection. These are the type of adjectives that describe our conditional perfection in Christ. They're words that describe something that is otherworldly without being bizarre or frightening. Okay. Whenever Hollywood tries to show something otherworldly, it always looks weird. <laughs> but in Christianity, we have otherworldly things about us, but they're not bizarre, are they? Of course not. So in Galatians 5, 13 to 25, Paul uses the words that describe the state of actual perfection, a measure of which we seek to attain while in our natural bodies. So the words describe a state that can be attained, experienced, and observed while one is in a physical and yet even sinful physical body. Things like love and joy and peace. These things don't, mean, don't earn me heaven. Because I have peace doesn't mean you know, I'm going to heaven. Because I have, quote, self-control doesn't mean I'm going to heaven. But these things do provide comfort until that time. And also a witness to other people that even though I am still in a sinful physical body, there's something definitely heavenly and Christ-like about me, about you, about all Christians. And so with these thoughts in mind, let's examine the words and ideas that Paul lays before us in Galatians 5 as he describes the actual perfection that Christians can achieve through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there's the preamble. We get into our lesson now. 
the letter to the Galatians. The letter to the Galatians was a letter written by Paul to a group of churches that he had established in Asia Minor during his missionary journeys. It seems that certain teachers had gone in after him and had begun to teach these brethren that they weren't truly saved. In other words, they didn't have that conditional perfection. But they weren't truly saved without adhering to certain teachings that included compulsory circumcision. In addition to this, these teachers were attacking Paul's credibility as an apostle and as a leader. Apparently some in the church were shaken by these new teachings and were considering a change in their belief, a change in their practice. And so in response to these events, Paul writes this letter, a white hot letter, where he establishes seven important points. Point number one, those who pervert the gospel will be condemned. That's the first point he makes. Galatians 1, 6 to 8, he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. This, of course, as a judgment against the false teachers who were in essence saying that in order to receive you know, this conditional perfection, you had to adhere to a combination of teachings and laws and rules over which they presided. That was the idea. The chief being circumcision, but also it included rules about food and you know, marriage and so on and so forth. So this was salvation by works. That's what they were promoting. Earning your perfection, which was not what the gospel taught. Those who taught another form of gospel, Paul wrote, should be and would be accursed. That's his first point. Next point, Paul was a legitimate apostle, verse 11 and 12. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. His doctrine was not man-made, as was that of the false teachers, but received from God through a revelation of Christ. Only the gospel has God's ordained way to be saved, conditional perfection. And Paul was the messenger of that good news and he reminds his readers. He didn't even talk about the false teachers. He just says, hey, I'm the legit apostle because I received the gospel from Jesus himself. I don't know where these guys got their teaching. That's between the lines. Third thing he tells them, he was ready to defend this gospel to anyone. Verse 13, he says, the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, that's Peter, in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews. We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. So the maintaining of the purity of the teaching of the gospel that's how one becomes conditionally perfect, was so important that Paul had challenged both Peter, who had great influence in the church, and Barnabas, his former teacher and mentor, in defending the truth, you know, because Peter was slipping at some point. He was participating you know, in, in, in activities in the church at Antioch with, uh, with the Gentiles. He sat and ate with them, he taught them, so on. and then when some legalistic brethren from Jerusalem came to visit the church at Antioch, whoa, he backed away from the Gentiles. Whoa, he didn't eat with them anymore. You know, he was afraid of what they would say about him. And, and this is Paul answering what, uh, what Peter had done. He'd stand up to anybody, even Peter and Barnabas, in the defense of the gospel. So no position, no relationship was more important than maintaining the integrity of the gospel 
um, gospel message. Fourth thing that he says, he reviewed once again the manner in which a person receives conditional perfection. Chapter 3, 26 and 7, he says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Paul uses another image here, another analogy to describe conditional perfection. He refers to it as putting on Christ. You know, we put on the perfect nature and essence of Christ when we believe in Him. Paul even reminds them of the moment, this transformation from imperfect and weak and condemned to perfect, powerful and pure took place. He tells them in the waters of baptism. It's amazing, in, uh, you know, you go back to Bible talk, uh, you know, we get a lot of mail and a lot of comments you know, uh, every day, every week. And one thing that, 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 that comes all the time, all the way through from so many different people, the objection and the, 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 you know, they want to debate it, is the role of baptism in the process of, of salvation. I don't know how many letters and, and arguments people send me, no, 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 that's a work of the law and so on and so forth. So it's nothing new, this debate, this idea, okay? So Paul has said in the verses leading up to this uh, that conditional perfection is not attained through a system of rules or laws or restrictions and rituals overseen by men, given by men. Salvation and the conditional perfection that it gives us is freely bestowed on those people who believe in Jesus Christ and who respond to Him in faithful obedience. Uh, what faithful obedience? Well, repentance and baptism. How do we know that? Because that's what Peter preached on Pentecost. One might ask, but there are still things that people do in their response of faith. Isn't this a kind of a work? And this is always the argument that they're making, you know, that they write or email or whatever. You know, baptism is a work. You're doing something. And you, you know, that, that's, that's salvation by works, they say. Well, the answer is, well, yes, baptism is something you do. Of course it is. But realize that there are concrete things that people do when they come to Christ. It's not as if, you be, it's not as if you're standing there waiting for a bus and then all of a sudden, poop, you're a Christian and nothing has happened. You, know, you, 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 were, you were not thinking about Jesus, nothing. All of a sudden, boom, you, you're a Christian and you're saved. And that's basically what you know, Calvinism teaches. God reaches out, chooses you, saves you, you have nothing to do with it. And yet, there are things you do in the process of salvation. I mean, don't you listen to the gospel? <laughs> Who would argue that you, shouldn't, that you don't have to at least listen to the gospel? That's doing something. You have to decide that you're going to believe. That's doing something. You have to repent of your sins. Have you ever seen someone who became a Christian that did not repent of their sins? Repentance, that's doing something. You confess your faith. You know, even, even our Baptist friends who say, well, you know, uh, confess Jesus and accept Him into your heart. Well, that's something you do, isn't it? Don't you say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You're doing something. And then people are baptized. Yeah, you're doing something. And then you choose to remain faithful. That's doing something. Those are all things you do. But they are not works of the law. And here's why. All of these things, we can actually do them. Hearing the gospel, I can do that. Deciding to believe, I can do that. Repenting of my sins, I can do that. Those are all things within my ability to do. Keeping the law perfectly, oh, this we cannot do, no matter how hard we try. The thing that people who you know, argue against baptism never mention because they say, well, you know, that's a work of the law. Well, <laughs> if you want to be saved by the law, you better, you better obey the law perfectly. Not just do one of the works of the law, you better do all the works of the law perfectly if you want to be saved by that system. 
Another reason, these things are given to us by God as a response of faith to Him. Human beings did not invent the idea of repentance. Human beings did not invent the idea of baptism. This, this was given by God. Keeping the law, rules, enforced rituals, these things were not given by God as the response of faith to Christ. Do we see these things in the Bible? Yes, we see it in the Old Testament. But these are not things that Christ has given us to do in response of faith. And then thirdly, these things are effective. Faith expressed in these ways do grant us conditional perfection and lead us to actual perfection. Law keeping leads to pride, discouragement, and division. Hmm. And that's what was happening in the Galatian church. You can always tell when the doctrine isn't right. <laughs> Everybody's fighting. <laughs> Everybody's unhappy. There are power struggles, you know. And so Paul aggressively defends the gospel and its teaching that conditional perfection is received through faith, absolutely through faith, and that faith is expressed in obedience to God's word and in no other way. If God didn't say, repent and be baptized, then I would not have repented and been baptized. But God clearly tells us that over and over and over again. I mean, I don't know how you can miss it. Ten times in the book of Acts alone. Fifth thing that Paul says. He points out what's at stake in the church there. And what's at stake is freedom. He says, so also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. So in chapter four, uh, Paul looks at the matter from the perspective of the teachers and what their motivations might be. And he reveals the true reasons for teaching what they do. You know, that you need to be circumcised, you need to obey the food laws, you need to do what we tell you, blah, blah, blah. And the reason that they're doing this, one word, power. Power. To introduce a new teaching uh, and discrediting him as an apostle, these men were trying to control the churches. And Paul fires back that the gospel has the power to free them from the slavery. And slavery to what? The gospel frees us from slavery to uninspired ideas about the world and our place in it. The gospel frees us from our own sinfulness. The gospel frees us from condemnation caused by our own imperfection. The revelation of God, which is the gospel, accomplished by Jesus, that leads them to conditional perfection, also frees them from all of this. I mean, that's like, that's, that's like one of the best gifts of, of, of the gospel. It frees us. I'm no longer prisoner of, quote, religion, false religion. I'm no longer prisoner of my own self-condemnation. <clears throat> I'm not a prisoner of that anymore. <clears throat> if God accepts me, well, then I can accept me. And it's not that I don't care that you accept me or not. That's, that's arrogant to say a thing like that. We all care. We want to be accepted by one another. But my happiness is not based on if you or you or you accept me. My happiness is based on the fact that God accepts me and allows me to accept me. Boy, oh boy, that's freedom. So the revelation of God, as I say, frees them from all of this. They know about themselves and who God is. They have dealt with their sinfulness through the cross of Christ. And now with conditional perfection, they no longer fear death and condemnation. Most Christians, you know, they're afraid of suffering. 
the suffering, you know, the physical suffering that many times accompanies death, but they're not afraid of death itself, the passing over into the spiritual world. We're not afraid of that. As a matter of fact, Paul says that their conditional perfection, and here he calls it what? He calls it sonship. You're all sons of God, same thing. Why are you a son of God? Well, he considers you perfect, same thing. He says the sonship enables them to call on God as their daddy, Abba, diminutive form, meaning daddy. An intimate term reserved for only the closest relationship between fathers and children. So following the, way, following the way of the false teachers here will not only imprison them, but will cost them this special relationship with God. Sixth thing that he says, he warns them, he warns them. He says, behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. So before, Paul warned and condemned the false teachers and their motives. You know, teach false doctrine and you will not only fail to achieve your goals, but you'll be condemned. That's what he says to the teachers. In this chapter, he warns the Christians who are being seduced by this teaching. Receive and follow false teaching and you will not achieve your goal. Well, what is your goal? Well, conditional perfection. And you will be condemned as well. For all those who think, well, there's no way a Christian can you know, lose his salvation, they have not carefully read Galatians 5, verses two to four. Because here he clearly says, if you follow, you know, if you fall away and follow a false teaching, then you'll suffer the consequences of that. I mean, what does it mean you have fallen from grace? What does, it, what does it mean you have been severed from Christ? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be severed from Christ. Sounds like death to me. So one question that may arise is this. What was it that was so alluring about the false teachers and teachings in the first place? What was the big deal? Why were they, you know, if, if the gospel is so terrific and if, if the gifts that come with the gospel are you know, so marvelous, you know, why were they being seduced away? Especially to you know, mutilate themselves with circumcision and take on all kinds of rules and regulations. The answer, Adherence to a set of laws and rules and rituals is appealing for three reasons. Number one, it's easier. It is easier to walk by sight than to walk by faith. You can't see conditional perfection. You have to accept God's promise that He sees you in this way. All you actually see is imperfection and failure and two steps forward and one step back. That's what you see in your Christian life. It's easier to base our confidence in things that are done, rituals that are performed, marks on our bodies, secret language, good work, self-denial. These are things that we can see and count and measure and compare and consequently grow in confidence. Wasn't that the problem with the Pharisees? They were tithing even you know, the, the, the spices that they had in the spice rack. They were tithing those. Talk about following carefully and proud of it. You know, what, could you imagine a conversation between two Pharisees and a third Pharisee who didn't bother with that? That guy, he doesn't tithe the salt. <laughs> he doesn't tithe the pepper. Can you, is he, you think he's saved? I don't know, I'm not sure about that guy. It's much harder to accept by faith that you are perfect while all you see around you is imperfection. <laughs> it's difficult for me to accept the idea that God sees me as perfect, as perfect as Christ is, because when I see me, boy, I don't see that at all. Another reason why salvation by works is alluring, it appeals to our pride. Each person struggles with a measure of pride and a system that saves you while leaving your pride intact is very desirable. Oh yeah. 
If faith requires the death of self, then a promise of salvation that allows self to live, to thrive, becomes seductive. In a works salvation, you can compare how I am doing compared to how this guy is doing. And comparison breeds pride. I mean, that's what competition is all about. And pride breeds blindness, and blindness breeds excess. Salvation, conditional perfection, based on faith, leaves no room for self. Why? Because Christ is the one who earned that conditional perfection on our behalf by dying on the cross. Conditional perfection leaves no room for comparison. Everyone is equally perfect in the eyes of Christ. Salvation by faith in Christ humbles the heart and opens the eyes. That's why it is difficult on our pride. Salvation by work is appealing also because it offers power over others. A human system requires humans to oversee it and religious power is every bit as enjoyable to wield as corporate power or any other kind of power. I mean, take a look at you know, old, old line religions, right? And the leaders of old line religions, they drive a lot around in limousines, they live in palaces. They eat and drink like kings. And you ask yourself, how can they reconcile that lifestyle to Jesus? I mean, in this country, we're, you know, we're pretty rich. We're, we're in the top 1% you know, of the whole world. And our faith requires us to kind of you know, tamp down our pride and humble ourselves. And sometimes we humble ourselves uh, by the rate of giving, the, the amount of time that I give to the Lord in service, the amount of money that I give to the Lord, the, the amount of uh, whatever I give to the Lord slows down my success, slows down my accumulation of wealth, slows down my pride. How, how do you reconcile the idea that you, you live like a, yeah, you live like a king and yet you represent Jesus? Well, the pursuit of perfection through law will allow you to do a thing like that. Works need to be explained. They need to be counted. Rituals need to be performed. Holiness is measured and weighed. Works systems have their administrators who have power, especially life and death power over people, which is what religious power is. Salvation by faith recognizes that power is in God's hands and He empowers people for service and witness, not for spiritual dictatorship over Christians, over other Christians. There is power in Christianity, but it resides in the word of God and it is exercised to build others up, not to control them. Not to control them. And so Paul warns the Galatians not to be seduced by the powerful temptation to try and achieve and maintain a state of conditional perfection through a system of law and work. It will not work. They will lose their standing before God as perfect through faith if they continue to pursue this. Okay, and the last thing, the seventh thing he says, he encourages them to pursue actual perfection. He says, for you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. These brethren were facing the dilemma that I have tried to explain to you in the last three lessons. If I am perfect in God's sight through faith in Christ, what do I do with the imperfection of my present life? 
the evidence of which is painfully before me every day. So if I'm perfect in the eyes of God, what do I do with the rest of my life? Well, the false teachers, they had their answer. They say, maintain that conditional perfection by keeping a series of rules and laws and rituals and symbols, chief of which was circumcision. Follow us and we will teach you and we will lead you. This, of course, had led to division and discouragement. Paul's response was to encourage them to, quote, walk in the spirit, or as we've been saying, pursue actual perfection, same thing. Not a way of law keeping, but a way of life that continually reinforced their belief that they were perfected through faith in Christ. So walking in the spirit, or pursuing actual perfection, would transform them in such a way that their lives would become a witness to others of the truth that perfection by faith was the only way to go. And so Paul in the last part of his epistle will describe the nature of the change that takes place in a person whose heart is fully convinced that he is through faith perfect in Christ and whose body pursues actual perfection through the Holy Spirit in order to confirm this fact. So let's summarize what we've covered so far. All right, then the lesson is yours. Number one, Paul is responding to Christians who are being seduced into thinking that they can maintain their conditional perfection before God in some other way other than faith in Christ. How do I maintain that conditional perfection? I continue to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. If I'm having a good day, I continue to believe that Jesus has perfected me in Christ. I'm having a bad day, I continue to believe that Jesus has made me perfect through Christ. Up, down, around, good day, bad day, failure, success, through all of it, I continue to believe that God has perfected me through faith in Jesus Christ. Number two. Paul teaches, or, or the teachers rather, he opposes, are promoting the idea that obeying laws and rules and customs will guarantee their perfect status before God. Number three, Paul refutes and condemns these teachers, their teachings, and of course, the results. And the results are clear. They're fighting, they're discouraged, they're divided. Number four, he reminds the Galatians of the manner they were saved, and that is Christ's death for their sins. And, and you know, we, we, we talked about this before, right? The death of Jesus makes restitution for all of our sins. You know, when you say He died for our sins, what does that mean? Every sin we make causes us to have a moral debt before God because God is the lawgiver, we're breaking His law. We have to answer to Him. So you steal, you owe a certain moral debt to God for having stealed. You may go to jail you know, and, 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 and for a year and you've paid your debt to society because you, know, you stole, you got caught, you went to jail, you're free. You've paid your debt to society, but you haven't paid your debt to God with jail time. Jail time only pays your debt to society. It doesn't pay your debt to God. You have a moral debt that you owe God. You commit adultery, you owe a debt to God. Even if you go to your spouse and say, look, I did a bad thing, I'm sorry, please forgive me, and you work it out and everything is okay, and she forgives you, he forgives you, whatever, and then you go on and you succeed and your marriage continues, good for you. Your, your spouse has forgiven you but you still owe God for that adultery. That debt hadn't been paid. You get the point? And so the indebted, the moral indebtedness that we have to God, Jesus makes restitution for that moral debt on the cross. And because of that, we become conditionally, conditionally perfect. He reminds the Galatians of the message that revealed this to them, and that was the gospel itself, not what the false teachers are teaching. He reminds them, the messenger who brought the news, and that was 
himself. Remember me, he says, I'm the one that you know, preached to you this good news. He reminds them the status that they are in and their status in Christ, conditional perfection. Why? Because Jesus has made, had made restitution for their sins. I, I repeat it over and over again because this is the biggest theological mistake that Christians make. You do not make restitution for your own sins through repentance. That's not how you make restitution for your moral debt, through your repentance. Your repentance is a change of heart about sin. That's what repentance is. He reminds them how to access and remain in this condition, in this conditional perfection. And that is, of course, your continued faith in Christ and continued belief in what He has done for you. And finally, the lifestyle that confirms this faith, walking by the Spirit. This is how I confirm that I am conditionally perfect. I walk by the Spirit. Walking by the Spirit doesn't pay for my sins. Jesus did that already. Walking, walking by the Spirit is an expression of my faith. If I make an effort to do good, I'm doing it because I want to express my faith in Jesus and glorify, and glorify God. All right, next time we're going to start to examine the Spirit-filled life, what Paul describes as the fruit of the Spirit, and we'll pick that up next time we get together. All right, thank you for your attention.